So my presentation came out of um, actually comments from all of you from uh, our last couple of conferences and thinking about wanting to hear a little bit more about the international and what's happening on the international front. Um, and so in wanting to uh, focus on that kind of an idea just a little bit, recognizing, of course, that the key word in, in all of this is an overview, because there is a lot going on on the international scene. And so um, decided to sort of pick and choose a little bit of a few countries to talk about and not certainly the whole thing. So I, I just say that right up front. Um, and I'm focusing a little bit more on uh, the opposite of kind of what Callie just did, which was sort of more of the grassroots looking at the, the organization of women's baseball um, on the international scene and trying to look beyond the countries that we often hear about, Canada, Japan, Australia, things like that, to some of the others that are participating and things that are going on. Um, and a lot of what happens, happens um, for the international scene, just as it does here in the United States, um, through the tournaments that are offered. And the big one, of course, being um, the Women's World Cup, um, which was last offered in 2018 and was supposed to happen. And COVID, of course, uh, put paid to that in 2020. And so the upcoming uh, next World Cup is in 2024. Right now, they're in the process of um, going through a lot of qualifying um, events to participate and, and hopefully achieve one of those 12 spots that is open for the uh, World Cup. And so um, that is what many countries putting together national teams out of some of the um, existing teams and league organizations within their countries. Um, and so this is this is the, the elite tournament for all of them to think about. Um, we do know that there are over 30 countries currently, um, up to almost 35 that have organized teams at various levels, um, much of it being um, 16 and above, harder to find some of the organizational details uh, below that. Every country is different in terms of how it's set up and how these ideas are governed and who pays for it and who oversees, but a lot of them um, are connected with existing men's organizations um, that have oversight often from the federal government level. Um, sometimes, for example, like in Australia, it's done at the province level as well. Um, and so very, very different structures, uh, depending on what country you are looking at and, and, and where uh, and how they're, how they're funded and those kinds of things. Um, in terms of outside the, the most elite level, the national team, which is what a lot of them are aspiring to create, there's lots and lots of movement. Teams come and go, um, country, the support has varied dramatically. Um, so you might find a country that had a team in 2017, but has nothing um, again in 2018 and those kind, and then it comes back again in 2020. Um, and a lot of that has to do with something that Kelly was just talking about and answering a question, the availability of resources. And those resources obviously run the gamut from just purely the monetary to the equipment itself, but also the people resources and just the support as to whether or not it's there. Um, in some of these countries, it's difficult even to get men's teams up and running. And so they, those usually are the predecessor to seeing a women's team start. Um, and so for a lot of them, there's not a lot of opportunity to play internally. And so they're looking at the international tournaments, which are incredibly expensive. And so looking for the support in order to be able to take part in some of those international tournaments. Um, and so looking to other countries, looking to fundraisers, looking for grants, um, those kinds of things are always a necessity at all levels. And so um, as Callie was saying, this is something very true, um, no matter where you're looking at. Okay? So um, one of the interesting things that the Women's Baseball Softball, Softball Confederation, which oversees um, the World Cup and, and a lot of um, international men's play has created over the last few years a ranking of um, women's baseball teams um, around the world. And I thought you might find this interesting. Um, currently, you know, surprise, they've been at the top for a while, is Japan. Um, the, and this is talking about the national teams for these countries, um, followed by Taipei, Canada. You can see the United States there um, sitting at the fourth rank right now. Um, Venezuela has taken a huge leap forward in the last couple of years. Uh, in 2018, they were ranked 12th. 
and they have moved up into the uh, fifth spot in this particular uh, world ranking. Same thing with the Dominican Republic. We've seen a lot of uh, movement there. Um, Cuba has moved down a little bit, being replaced by Venezuela and the Dominican currently. Um, and then here is the rest of um, the world ranking. So it gives you a sense of some of the other countries that are playing. And so the question was asked about uh, Korea, certainly. Um, South Korean team is there. Um, the presence of some of the European teams, um, China, Nicaragua, and some of the most recent are India and Pakistan um, making their way into these rankings. And so these are simply the teams and the rankings are based on their participation in international tournaments. Um, that are recognized. And so these rankings um, are given out at the end of each year based on uh, tournament play. And so this is the current, uh, they'll do another one at the end of 2022. And we'll see where some of these, because uh, there's been a lot of tournament play this year, um, as things have sort of opened back up again, you get that opportunity to see uh, many of them moving forward in their play. An example of that um, is this year's European Championship, which was just concluded um, with four teams participating in the European Championship, the Czech Republic, France, Great Britain, and the Netherlands. Um, and the French uh, came out the victorious in the European Championship, uh, defending their title, which they won uh, in the previous tournament um, in 2019. In 2019, they beat the Netherlands to win the tournament. And here in um, 2022, they beat the Czech Republic. And of course, that then gives them a one of the spots in the next semi-qualifying round leading towards participation in um, the Women's World Cup. And so the French um, have secured that spot based on that. Um, and so when they most recently beat the Czech Republic, to win, this is a picture of them celebrating afterwards. They won that particular game by a 13 to three score. Um, and the young lady, the winning pitcher in that was a young lady by the name of Cassandra Vigneault. Um, it was her second victory in the tournament. Um, and she was supported on the, the hitting side of things by the tournament MVP, uh, Marjorie Brunel, who was also the MVP for France um, in the 2019 tournament as well. Um, she hit 400 in the 2019 tournament and 429 in this most recent tournament. Um, but the leading hitter in the entire tournament was a young lady from the Netherlands, um, a young lady by the name of Anouk Vergunst, who hit 667 um, in the five game tournament um, to help with the Netherlands um, coming in third place out of the four teams uh, in 2019 the Netherlands were in the second place. Uh, the French beat them uh, five to two in order to win. So they are de defending champs in this European tournament. Um, and this is a fairly recent development, um, this European I tournament. The French have had a women's baseball team since 2013. And so, um, but participating in this European championship 2019 and then 2022, this is a new development for them based on the new structure that they've developed for the Women's World Cup in order to have these qualifying uh, rounds um, to bring team specific. So for example, in 2024 for the Women's World Cup, there'll be 12 teams, four from the Americas, one from Europe, four from Asia, one from Oceania, and uh, two wildcard teams that are going to be chosen by the overarching organization. And the assumption is that those two wildcards will probably go uh, to the United States and Canada. Uh, so that's kind of how that structure works. Um, here is a picture from the 2019 uh, championship um, when France uh, beat the Netherlands in there. So the French uh, led the way in that particular tournament. Most recently, the US and Canada played in a, a friendship series. It was held in um, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, and you can see the uh, United States uh, came out on top in that um, winning the first two games, 16 to two and seven one, Canada uh, winning two, and then the US winning in a fifth one. Um, the two, the key players on both sides, uh, Claire Eccles was a name that might sound familiar to some um, as she made history a few years ago playing in men's league in Canada um, and playing here in the United States as well. 
Um, and then leading hitter on uh, the Canadian side was Maddie, uh, Maddie Willen. And then um, again, a couple names that you would recognize if you follow the women's national team here in the United States, um, Marty Sementelli. And we were talking last night about Kelsey Whitmore, who's now playing um, for the Staten Island Ferry Hawks. And so uh, this friendship series um, is again, another one of those opportunities to take the national teams from both the US and Canada and give them a chance to um, play more elite competition as they try to prepare for um, potential of playing in the Women's World Cup coming up. And so um, a new series as well. So we're constantly seeing additions. And the nice thing is with many of these, um, with the explosion of social media, a lot of these series are available to watch either live streaming on YouTube as this one was, or certainly um, afterwards, the recordings are all there. Um, so if you look them up, you can, you can watch all of these uh, games on YouTube and, and see for yourselves the quality of play that we're talking about here um, with the uh, women's teams. And this is simply from the most recent uh, tournament uh, friendship series between the U.S. and Canada. So giving you a little bit of a vision. And again, this was in one of the um, main stadiums in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Switching gears just a little bit to show the contrast. Um, we talked last year, some may remember, about the efforts in, in Ghana um, to promote just baseball in general. And uh, Victor Buxton, who's working very directly with these teams. Um, this is a picture of one of the, one of the local teams in the city of Pema um, with their first young female player. Her name was Clara. And for a while, she was the only girl on um, the teams that were playing in the city of Pema in Ghana. Um, but this is a much more recent picture. And you can see the um, addition of a number of other young ladies who have joined. Um, and this is the effort um, following sort of what Callie was talking a little bit about earlier of trying to ensure equal opportunity across the board. Um, and but their issue is resources um, in terms of equipment and things like that. And there are a couple of organizations um, that exist that are out there. Um, one of them created by, his name is gonna escape me, the major league player from, and somebody will remember from South Africa who created an organization to help um, gather supplies that could be distributed throughout Africa just in general. Um, and so this is a good example of the kind of efforts that are happening at the grassroots level in many, many countries to encourage um, women's play. And so the international game is gradually growing at, at all levels. Um, so good example of that here in Ghana. Um, just to take a look at Puerto Rico as one of the examples of one of those uh, more elite national teams, because it's not one you hear a great deal about. And it's kind of an interesting story because in Puerto Rico, they have an actual women's league that has existed since 2009. Um, didn't play during the pandemic, but it, is come, it has come back. Um, and they currently have nine teams playing um, from last year's, in last year's league and 10 in this year's. Um, the league play is divided into a 5-5 five, five, um, division with uh, a championship series played at the end. And since 2009, um, one team has dominated the Lobos, uh, but recently um, the Arte team called the Artesanias de las Piadras um, were the 2019 victors. So a um, lot of organizational support for uh, Puerto women's baseball in Puerto Rico. Um, their national squad finished just to get ninth at the 2018 World Cup held, held here in the United States. Um, but most recently, um, they played in, in the um, World Baseball Softball Confederation America's qualifier and secured a spot in the next round for 2023 to essentially the semifinals to qualify for the World Baseball Cup. Um, and they qualified along with Mexico, Cuba, and Venezuela all secured. Um, the Puerto Rican team was undefeated in that series. Um, led by their star pitcher, uh, Jean-Elise Rivera, who just pitched 14 innings in two games, came out victorious in both, struck out 14 batters and had a 0 .50 ERA. Um, and their leading hitter was Adrix Paradiso, who hit 533 in that particular series um, in, when, in, in defeating uh, 
both Mexico and uh, Venezuela to secure their spot. Um, and so Puerto Rico um, has a much more structure than a lot of the other countries with the league play that exists um, internally. Um, and this is uh, Adric, Adric's Paradiso, one of the players from the Puerto Rican team who uh, led, their, led their hitting side in the, as I said, the most recent um, America's uh, qualifier. And that involved um, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. So there were six teams um, involved in that particular qualifying event that took place. Also, um, most recently in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, in 2019, Diamolette Quiles uh, signed a contract to play in their men's superior double A league first baseman for the uh, Mountaineers. And in a double header on May 19th of 1919, um, she appeared in both games. And while she was 0 for 4 in the double header hitting, um, her manager said afterwards that she had done a marvelous job in the field and that while she was 0 for 4, she didn't have any strikeouts and that she uh, made contact with the ball every time. So it was very pleased um, with that beginning effort. Um, she didn't play again that season for them because of an injury. And so it was, but she was the first woman to play in their, men, in their men's pro league. And so some little bit of progress being made there in Puerto Rico because of um, the extent of women's play there and the organizational structure that is behind um, their efforts. We talk a lot about Australia and we hear a lot about what's happening there, their efforts to start pro leagues and things. So I thought I'd take a look at um, New Zealand over in that part of the world to see what was happening. Um, and New Zealand is currently, and we're currently um, on target to create a um, women's team for 18 and above and 14 to 18 and under 11. And so in 2019, this is the Queensland team that played in their um, national, their city uh, under 11 tournament. Unfortunately, the pandemic kind of um, stalled some of their progress because they were in the process of creating a national women's baseball festival that would invite teams from all of the different provinces throughout New Zealand. And they're hoping to um, see that come to fruition again in 2013. And so building that sort of from the bottom up, which is exciting because they're hoping that that would lead to eventually the, for them on the elite side, being able to create a national team and participate then in some of these um, international tournaments. And so New Zealand is kind of just getting started. Um, men's baseball is um, same way. It is not, not huge there, but it is definitely a presence. Um, and then here's a picture of some of what happening in Pakistan. Um, not only does Pakistan have a um, national team and a national squad that builds from some of the uh, play at the lower levels, and this is simply a um, city team, has a two-team uh, league, and so um, the girls rely on local support in order to be able to play. Um, a lot of this has stalled due to some of the governmental changes and some of the things that are happening in, just in general in Pakistan, but um, it is and is developing as a fairly popular sport for young girls to play. Um, the big challenge is again, the resources and the idea that um, girls are being allowed to participate in sports just in general. And so um, taking part in something like this is, um, a huge opportunity for them, but a difficult one to necessarily support all the time. And so um, same, and they are hoping to develop to the point where they may do some um, cross play with India um, and, and have some tournaments that would just involve um, Pakistani teams and Indian women's teams, which would be pretty exciting to see. Um, when we think about the UK, and Kelly mentioned that, and we know that Great Britain participated for the first time this year in the European um, Championships and actually won their first international tournament game in that. But when we think about the UK, the teams expand beyond just um, those in 
um, England itself and into Scotland and into Wales as well. And so um, this is uh, a combination team of some of those players from Scotland and from um, Great Britain uh, getting ready to play in an internal tournament within the country. And many of us are familiar with the role that Amanda Hocking has played in um, promoting and supporting the play in Great Britain. Um, and so lots happening there. Uh, and here are just some other examples of the top picture on the left is um, one of the local Scottish teams playing um, the same thing. And then the team on the right is a team out of um, Croatia, uh, a women's team that is playing there. And then you have a 14 and under team um, from Australia and uh, another 14 and under team on the bottom right, also out of um, one of the provinces in Australia where there are lots and lots of leagues and there is great support and money and the efforts to develop a professional women's baseball league are underway there in Australia. Um, Australia, Canada, and Japan probably being the most organized, most well supported on the international scene currently. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a visual on that idea. And then today, as we are sitting here listening and going to listen to a variety of presenters over the course of the day, um, the national championships um, in, in the UK are, are actually taking place um, at Leicester Diamonds. And so their national championship um, is actually being played today. And so hopefully um, by tomorrow, it will be out there on YouTube. And so everybody can uh, check out what happened. So it's happening as we are actually meeting here today that we're seeing uh, some of this kind of thing occurring. And so a little bit of an overview of what is happening on, and I realize so much more you could talk about, but I wanted to uh, give you that uh, quick overview. And I'm happy at this point to take any questions that anybody might have. Okay, uh, Ryan Woodward asks, is there anything we can do collectively to influence more opportunities for these teams to compete? Olympic baseball and softball seems very touch and go and the 2015 Pan Am Games are really successful, but we haven't seen women's baseball in that event since. Yeah, that's a great question, Ryan. And, and we often look to that level, right? And unfortunately, the, the whole issue of the Olympics being the, that international opportunity um, doesn't seem to have any stability at all. And so I think instead, what we uh, can probably do is look to something like the World Cup um, and some of now these uh, newer uh, tournaments that are arising and offering our support both in not only um, monetary things like that, but more importantly, in actually being viewers and thinking about how we can promote awareness that these leagues exist and that these teams are out there because that's part of it. Um, because it's amazing with the most recent couple of series um, being able to be live streamed, the viewership had gone up, goes up significantly, right? And of course that viewership promotes sponsorship dollars when they realize, yes, there is actual interest, um, but how do you promote interest without promoting awareness? So I think um, that's one of the key things that we all can do as organizations is to try to help promote some of these kinds of things as best we can. Um, yeah, um, probably going along with that. Jude asks, is there a list of current women's professional baseball leagues? There is not a, that I am aware of one single list anywhere. There, so the Women's Baseball uh, Softball Confederation keeps track of tournament play and keeps track of countries that are participating and is a good place to find. Um, but unfortunately, currently, and that's something I think um, we want to see change, for example, um, that's the kind of thing that could find a place to reside on the inter on our international women's uh, baseball uh, website, right, in terms of thinking about pulling those kinds of things together. But right, currently, there is not one single place where you can go find all of those leagues. Adam Korungold wants to know a little more about the Women's World Cup. So the Women's World Cup has been played um, since the early 2000s, and it used to be played every two years. Um, and it would, 
rotate to different, uh, so it's been played in Japan, played in Canada, um, was here in the United States in 2018. It was supposed to be played again, of course, in 2020, um, but did not that did not happen because of the pandemic. And then again, postponed in 2022, and they've now changed the structure. And the plan um, currently is that um, the Women's World Cup, instead of taking place every uh, two years, is now going to take place every um, four years. And so that certainly is um, a, a difference in uh, what was previously. And as a consequence, they, they changed it to this idea of every four years, hoping that that would give um, teams and countries maybe a little bit more chance to uh, have more experience and more play under their belts, but also create this structure underneath of these annual qualifiers along the way that allow more countries to participate. So the, the European uh, championship that just happened, the Americas, so six teams, four of those are gonna move forward out of the European, two of those move forward to the next round. And so that's kind of, and so now it's planned at least currently to happen every four years instead of every two years. Uh, Catherine Walden wants to know, um, are there channels or networks where all these games are aired or other kinds of streaming packages where you can get the support for? Um, a lot of them have been aired recently simply on YouTube. And then um, in the case of the European championships, it was, it was through YouTube in the case of um, a most recent tournament from um, Korea, it was done through a Korean channel. And so it kind of depends on their access, I guess. So there isn't, again, one single place that these are all being, a couple of them have put their games on their Facebook page. <laughs> um, so it kind of varies depending on their resources. Uh, Meredith asks, do you know what's occurring with women's baseball in Cuba as reflected in their dropping rankings? Yeah, um, so Cuba, from my understanding and, and me again with look at, has had some of the similar problems that others um, with just not playing during the pandemic. And, the, and, and sort of getting back on track. And uh, they didn't really have much going on for over two, over two years. And so I think that's more than anything else, the, the, what has happened with Cuba, they just didn't have. And so they're just getting back. And so I would expect that either at the end of this year or certainly next year's, we would see um, them probably maybe moving back up in the, in the rankings. But it also is just simply that some of these other teams, um, some of these other countries, particularly uh, the Dominican Republic, are relatively new. And so they moved from, they were 22nd in rank and they've moved up to sixth, um, just simply by getting the opportunities to play that they hadn't had before. 